You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling-up business coach Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash Thrive. That's E-C-K-F-E-L-D-T dot com slash Thrive. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeldt. I'm your host. And our guest today is Mark Fister. He is CEO of the Fister Strategy Group. Uh, people know him as the board architect. We're going to talk about boards. We're going to talk about the purpose of boards, what it means to have a good board, kind of good board practices, structure. He does a lot of work uh, with boards and consulting, sits on boards. He also speaks internationally on boards and governance. Really interesting topic. Uh, I think one of the things that becomes really important for businesses as they grow and scale, whether whether they're taking on outside equity or outside investment partners or not, just having good governance, having good boards in place and helping them really guide the business. We're going to talk a little bit about the purpose of a board, but it's really key for a leadership team, for a management team to have that in place so that they can operate efficiently, really think about strategy, have the good strategy in place and have part of the organization that's going to help them craft that and and make sure that's happening on a regular basis and, and is being governed in the right way. So we're going to talk about those things. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on and the we're recording this the end of April, kind of the COVID-19 pandemic that we're in and boards are becoming more and more important as people deal, as companies deal with these crises and pretty dramatic changes, both in their markets and internally. So we're going to talk a little bit of that as well. With all of that, Mark, welcome to the program. Thank you, Bruce. Glad to be here with you. Yeah. So we've got a lot kind of in that intro and, and kind of on our plate here, but why don't we start with just a little bit of your background and how you got into just kind of the, into working with boards, into helping advise companies on putting together boards, governance, and those topics. You know, it's a media area. I know you've been doing it for a while, but how did you get into it? What was the background? Sure. Well, it's kind of a roundabout uh, a way of entering into the governance and the management and the leadership realm. But my background, having been in science, technology, and engineering areas, it was very obvious to me early on in my career that that particular industry vertical specifically had issues with those that were very technically competent, but uh, had other issues with lack of, say, management or leadership skill set. So not only was I able to move up the ranks pretty quickly because of my uh, acumen in that space, but it became very much aware or I became very much aware that it wasn't just something that was in that industry, although it was more prevalent and uh, probably more easily witnessed in that industry. Yeah. But uh, across all industries, there there really was, uh, and still to this day, I think there's a lack of some of this, what I would call this leadership 101. Uh, and of course, without that, to build on top of that, typically if the foundation is not strong, it's not really going to lead down the right path at the by the end game. <laughs> yeah. And when did you decide that you were really focusing on this kind of board advisory, board consulting role and focusing on that? I mean, I know you've, you've written you know books, you've spoken quite extensively on this. How did this really become your area of expertise? It's been about uh, probably a decade now that I've been 100% focused in this space. But uh, over the years throughout my previous careers, I've also worked in many cases with the board or worked on strategic planning with boards as well as executives and C-level. I always knew that the best place to get strategy implemented properly against the goals that were set was typically to do this at the C-level and at the board level. So in many cases, I was handling uh, projects or pet projects, I used to call them, of the board or areas that were just of major importance from a business transformation aspect. And that's really where I started to cut my teeth in that board directorship space. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting area. So let's just kind of define a couple of terms or kind of orient people in terms of when we're talking about boards. And we've got boards of advisors, boards of directors, you know, there's different kind of groups or different kind of functions, depending on the nature of the company, whether you're public or private, whether you're nonprofit, give us a little bit of a framework in terms of when we talk about quote unquote boards, what are the different types of boards and different functions those boards play in different businesses? Sure. Well, the easiest way to look at it is a fiduciary board versus a non-fiduciary board. So when you hear of a board of directors, whether it be for a public or a private company, typically that board has voting rights and the decisioning of what is brought to the board and the direction, both on governance and strategy of that organization. 
at varying levels, of course, depending on the, the structure of the organization in the private space. In the public space, it's a little more set in terms of what uh, rights and obligations that that board has in terms of fiduciary responsibilities. When you talk about a board for a private company, we're looking more as uh, providing input, guidance, governance, and strategy. But in many cases, it's not always the full voting capacity in, in a private company, depending on the structure. Board of advisors, of course, I, I like to think of a board of advisors or a board advisor having the obligation or the responsibility in specific areas that they're asked to bring in their expertise. Typically, the expectation is lesser of a time commitment. There's no voting, of course, on as a non-fiduciary member in a board of advisors or being a board advisor. And this, you know, you'll see more today in certain private and even nonprofit spaces where the delineation between board member and board advisor, it's, it's not as clear as it used to be. There is yeah. some overlap in those spaces, but there are things you want to be careful of, uh, whether it comes down to liability or voting rights and those things. You want to make sure it's extremely clear on what your responsibilities are and what your liabilities are based on your type and how you're involved in the organization. Yeah, it's interesting one because I think we run across this quite a bit when working with leadership teams and they haven't really clarified or they they haven't defined what their board role is. And if it's advisory, without the fiduciary responsibility, it's really just sort of input, you know, maybe giving perspective. There may be kind of expertise that you're bringing to the table. But if you have a fiduciary responsibility, you're, you're really representing ownership or, you know, some kind of shareholder or investor. And you are there to make sure that their interests are represented and executed appropriately. And, and ultimately, I mean, I guess, explain to me how the CEO's role or how the board's role is related to management when you have a fiduciary responsibility. Because I think that's one thing people don't quite understand or sometimes get confused by in terms of a board's role in, in terms of putting management in place and their oversight of management. How does that typically work? Sure. The way I like to look at this is that, uh, you know, with fiduciary responsibility, you're truly thinking of uh, what the board would view as uh, noses in, fingers out, which means that you're overseeing and and you are governing and you are involved in the knowledge areas of what's happening in, from a daily viewpoint or even a monthly viewpoint in the organization. So your nose is in, but your fingers out, meaning that you're not jumping in, making decisions or leading uh, the, the organization or becoming the face of the organization internally so as not to undermine management or leadership of the organization. Yeah. So in saying that, typically the, the CEO, when you see a good relationship between the C-level, specifically the CEO and the board, it truly is something that is incredible because the the CEO has a whole network now of folks that are board directors that he or she can tap into for both guidance, experience as a sounding board. It's really when you get into these subservient board relationships with their CEO, when you, you start to realize that if anything, not only is it not good value, but it's actually detrimental to the business because it creates these, uh, these environments that really are not healthy and typically don't live up to the values that are set for these organizations. But the board itself is typically there to act as this governance or, or guiding body and to support, not just choose the CEO in a public space, but uh, also to guide that CEO appropriately. Mm -hmm. But again, when that works properly, it's uh, it's absolutely incredible how effective that can be. And uh, conversely, when it's not working, it's uh, incredible how detrimental that can be. Yeah, I think we sort of hear the stories, or we you know get the news reports of when when there's conflict between the CEO and the board, and CEOs get ousted, or there's you know power struggles and decision conflicts and stuff. But yeah, I do find that a, a good structure, a good relationship between management and a board can be. Uh, an added, uh, you know, one plus one equals three kind of situation if you really get synergy between them. What goes into, I guess, sort of structuring a board or deciding what kind of board you need as a company or want as a company? What are the factors that go into that decision? Sure. And, you know, that's exactly what my book was about uh, that came out uh, in, in the recent year or so. It's called Across the Board, the Modern Architecture Behind an Effective Board of Directors. And I was surprised to find out that there had never been an in-depth writing that created this blueprint or a roadmap for yeah. how to think about both the building from scratch of a board of directors, if you're a private company or even a nonprofit for that matter, what are you looking for? And for a public company with the needs that are out there today, which are, are huge, how do you look at rebuilding your board? Where do you start with that? If you have openings or mandatory retirements where people are leaving your board, you know, how do you look about, uh, how do you look at filling those seats? Do you just replace that seat with a like person that left? Or do you go back and do a study or an audit of this board to say, look, 
You know, yes, we had one person leave, but in our study, we noticed that we're missing one, two, three additional skill sets. So we, do we try to combine those into one person or do we look at possibly multiple board members that need to come in to fill those gaps? But I typically look at a board in, in really three levels or three areas of focus. One I call their sphere of influence. And if we could picture this just a, at a high level view, it's a circular chart. In the middle is uh, a deep leadership acumen. The next ring around that is uh, the ability or, or the expertise that that person had applied to operations. So it wasn't just a pie in the sky type of uh, leadership. It was somebody that also had some level of hands-on operations uh, and understood the daily workings of business and the challenges, by the way, that go along with that. And then around that, in this first step, sits the expertise or the experience areas. And this step is typically carried out by boards when they're looking at how they're structured. Many times this can be aligned to their committee structure or their expertise of each individual board member. But I think it needs to be looked at to a little bit of a deeper level to look at how the how the expertise and what we view as common committees are looked at into uh, comparing them to potentially non-common committees that many boards are implementing uh, today. So that's one level I call sphere of influence. The next is called planes of congruence. And these are areas that are usually skipped over by almost every board. And it's, it's uh, a lot of the consulting work that I do is in this architecture building. Planes of congruence are basically another level of horizontal comparisons or needs of a board. So you could look at these as individual requirements or uh, requirements of the board collectively. So an individual requirement or expectation may be that you're looking to get a balance in your planes of congruence of a balance of different personality types. I like to see a good balance across a board of the four personality types of analyst, diplomat, sentinel, and explorer. Mm -hmm. And when you're missing one of those types of personality types or different uh, traits, you're missing out on a whole other aspect of this diversity of thought that could come into your board and be challenged in a constructive way. That's one example. Another plane of congruence could be uh, looking at it from a diversity standpoint, different backgrounds of people, men and yeah. women different geographies, those types of things. And many times these are the exercises I work through with boards on, on how to look at what are most important to get that type of diversity and those requirements above and beyond just skill set and experience. The last area really has to do with the depth, what I call the depth of the board is step three of this, which is do you have more than just one person that has some sort of level of expertise or experience in an area that's important to the board? So a quick example of this that is uh, hugely noticeable on boards is that you'll see that they may have one technology person that also has maybe some cybersecurity background. Mm -hmm. Well, if they are the chair of the technology and cybersecurity committee on the board, nobody can really challenge them on what they propose to that board. Yeah. So looking at depth in this, it may not be somebody who has the same level of credential it may not be somebody who is in that particular space as a leader, but has some ability to challenge or ask questions, especially at a procedural level of that particular skill set area to avoid a siloed mentality. And yeah. those are really the three areas. So um, your sphere of influence, mm -hmm. your planes of congruence, and then the depth or the depth study of your board. Yeah, and I like the kind of different perspectives or the different facets that you're looking at with the board and this whole, you know, making sure that you've got diversity, because I think that's one of the classic missteps. <laughs> you end up, you know, creating a board that's basically just a whole bunch of friends and, uh, you know, people that think just like the CEO. And, and now you've got, you know, just a bunch of groupthink and there's no, really no constructive conflict and, and perspectives and, you know, alternative opinions and stuff that are coming in. So if you're kind of focused on this diversity, I mean, you could take each one of these and think through all the different needs that you have. You could end up having a board of, of 80 people on it, right? <laughs> if you're trying to get all these boxes checked, how do you kind of prioritize or how do you balance this? You know, I want a lot of perspective. I want a lot of depth. I want a lot of uh, kind of sphere of influence. But yes, I also, I also need to have a manageable group that is going to be working together effectively. What's the what's the kind of balancing process or the, the weighing that you do to bring those things together? Sure. And I will tell you in the hundreds of boards that I've helped to build or architect, you don't start with the person's name or the, uh, say, uh, you don't know, you don't put the person into the space yeah. first. You start with the requirements first. Yeah. And you know, as, as a as a summary to that, it's it's typically the board winds up being smaller when this level of rigor is put in in the early steps or in a rebuild, uh, re-architecture of a board. So when you look at the skill sets, if you start by looking at that sphere of influence and you look at the skill sets or the experience that is needed, in many cases, you can combine some of those areas. If you look at them as standalone skill set areas, first and foremost, mm -hmm. it may be that you can combine some of those based on the skill sets or just the propensity of those areas to be uh, combined in a leadership way, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just inherently in corporate America or, or around there, any position. So 
in doing this, it allows you first to evaluate the need and then look at how you can combine some of those positions or the, some of those knowledge areas and then specifically look for that person. If you do this the other way, that's typically how your board can grow. You may look at everything very myopically and say, okay, I need someone with marketing background and experience. I need someone with technology. I need HR. I need governance or strategic background. That's a much more myopic way to look at it because you're thinking of one individual skill set and an experience area yeah. to match one person to. But if you look at this from a different lens and you say, okay, this is these are the expertise areas I need, I may be able to package up the search into a, an area for a person that has maybe two, possibly three of those combined into one area. Still making sure that I'm getting that depth that I mentioned earlier as part of that step three of the build. Yeah, it's interesting. It is. It's kind of a Rubik's Cube you know, problem. It's like, I, I want to solve a couple of different needs with an individual. And if I just, if you approach it of just each person just fills one box, you're going to end up with a very big, complicated board. But if you, if you really kind of figure out, hey, I've got different needs in these different areas. And as I'm looking for candidates, making sure that I'm filling a couple of boxes each time so that I don't have to have, you know, 30, 40 people on the board, I can really do this with a handful of people, but still get that kind of diversity of backgrounds and capabilities and experience. Tell me a little bit about how you identify what are those needs? So how do you look at kind of the company, the industry, the situation, you know, where they are in their development and maturation? What, what, what are the things that go into identifying the priorities for what the board should have relative to where the company is and what it does and what they're trying to accomplish? Sure. Well, I can say that many times from a board consulting uh, viewpoint, I'm called in for one specific to drill down area of focus and where it usually leads is to a much bigger discussion yeah. on, you know, that, that typically is the is the effect, but it's not necessarily the cause of what's being focused on. So, you know, one area when we're talking about either people being added to the board or someone's retiring or, or rolling off the board because they've reached their, the end of their term, mm -hmm. it's typically to help out with the nominating process or even helping with the building the nominating process and or helping with the vetting process of getting the right person in that seat. That, to do that properly, it does lead down the path of having to look at how that board is architected and understand what other uh, existing expertise areas are staying on the board and looking both from a very near-term view, Bruce, but also looking from a long-term viewpoint of saying, what is this process we want to set up as a repeatable process uh, for the future? Because yeah. people do roll off boards quite often. And how do you replace those positions? And how do you make them worthwhile to the to the um, longevity of that organization? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you recommend or do you, is it a good practice to kind of bake in some kind of rolling term, you know, offset term so that you are kind of, you're not exiting a whole bunch of people at once or sort of haphazardly, but you're, you know, at either, you know, every four years, every three years, a, th a quarter or a third or some kind of natural rotation. So that isn't quite as jarring or how, how do you typically suggest people structure kind of terms and, you know, kind of the change of board process? Yeah, you, you see we're in the throes right now of back and forth on this. So when you talk about term limits, those term limits are, are typically there. Uh, they, they could be from a viewpoint of a mandatory retirement age, or it could be the maximum number of terms uh -huh. of whether it be a year, one year, two year, or three year consecutive terms. So that, that's one way to look at this. There's another way of looking at this where, and I'll parlay this into a quick summary in a moment in the public space. But the other way of looking at this is that so everybody's not rolling off at the same time, their terms are staggered. It's what they call a classified board. So it may be that there's two classes or three classes of directors, mm -hmm. and each one of those has a different start time and uh, subsequently a different end time of that particular term. So it prevents all of the uh, expertise and history of the knowledge of that organization and the board from rolling off simultaneously. So that's one way to look at it. Interestingly, with the time frames we're talking about where typically uh, staggered or classified boards look at maybe a two, possibly a three, and in some cases a four-year term, mm -hmm. when we think about that, that is not necessarily the case that's acceptable nowadays in the public space due to the fact that we're looking at one-year terms where shareholders want to have a say or at least weigh in on uh, the terms for those particular board directors. It also offers an out in some cases for boards where uh, they feel that a director is not performing to the level they should be or there's some other type of issue that came up. Mm -hmm. It allows that board to just not renew after a year that person's continuation on the board. So there's different viewpoints on it. It really depends on the 
scenario, but there is the, even in the public space, the boards have uh, in their bylaws what the rulings are and how they're going to follow these particular guidelines. Uh, in other cases, they're simply just saying it's a year and uh, we go back to uh, you know a, a reappointment on a yearly basis. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about operating the board. I guess what are some best practices in terms of what a board does, how often it does it, how it interfaces with management? What are some, some general kind of frameworks, guidelines, you know, models that good boards use to effectively interface with management and, you know, provide the insight and the oversight of uh, the business? Sure. Well, I mean, in most cases you hear about the the proverbial four to six board meetings a year, meaning the formal board meetings typically in person, although in the times, uh, you know, a lot of boards are meeting virtually, which they have to do and probably more frequently. But above and beyond those four to six formal board meetings, I am a firm believer that we should always view or board should always view the larger capacity for time dedication should be at the committee level. And that is truly where the work of a board gets done is within their committee areas. So those particular meetings, you know, if if you rolled all this together between the formal board meetings where the full team is present, and in addition to that, so if you are, say, uh, serving on a committee or the chair of a committee, you should truly allocate roughly and think about this as 250 hours a year as a board director and also having a responsibility on a committee. So that time commitment, you can kind of weigh into that if you subtract out the typical day or so for a day or day and a half for uh, those more formal board meetings, those four to six, all that remaining time should be applied to the time that's dedicated to getting what is needed within those committee areas and the commitments uh, to the committee areas completed. So the time commitment to me is typically very important. I want to make sure I'm answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I was, I mean, I think the time frame is a good kind of understanding. It's like, how much time does a board spend? I mean, I guess, give me a sense of how the board meeting runs versus a committee and, and how does the board and management work together in each of those? Like who's typically involved in the board meeting, you know, from the management point of view versus the committee point of view and, and how, you know, how does that typically play out? Sure. Well, the board is typically made up of those that are also committee members or committee chairs, right? In many cases, there is the CEO that's joining. Um, There's this big debate that still rages on about should the CEO also be the chairperson? My biggest points or my my biggest uh, evaluation in this is that if indeed the CEO is also the chairperson of the board, it is customary to assign a director on the board as what's called a lead director. And they are representing the collective uh, board itself. And I like to think they have the equal power as the chairperson that's also acting as the CEO. So it creates some of those checks and balances. Yeah. And that's, um, I'll say, equal power sharing with the board itself to avoid what we see in some cases where the board is simply just a figurehead group. And yeah, without, exactly. the, without that lead director, it can truly become that. Yeah. When it comes to the board meetings themselves, I'd like to see, I personally can judge the effectiveness of a board by observing their board meeting. And I only need to see one and I can tell, I can get a feel <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And in many cases, if there are debates and decisions that are happening over and over again in a board meeting, they're kind of missing the point of this because many of those discussions should have been worked out before uh, the the board meeting happened. And the information on what's going to be discussed, inclusive of the committee status update reports, should have been submitted at least a week in advance of that particular board meeting. So everybody's coming to that board meeting prepared. And what should mainly be discussed are areas that are either off plan or are at risk. Right now, it's good to say you you also want to give the pats on the back and understand what is it what's been accomplished, which are the positive sides to this. But focusing on the areas that need to be addressed and could be potential risks to the organization, that's where I like to see a good portion of these board meetings focused. Yeah, and what are some of the committees that typically are in place for most boards? Sure. Well, I mean, you have the proverbial committees, which uh, typically are governance and nominating. Sometimes they're combined. Sometimes they're separated. Many cases as an HR or human resources committee, you'll see a uh, compensation committee in many cases for uh, public companies. Mm-hmm. I like to look at some, a governance committee, of course, is, is usually a standing committee also. The one I like to see that I don't always see and I view it as extremely important is a strategic planning committee. Yeah. Many times boards believe that, uh, you know, well, the organization itself with the CEO as the owner, uh, they are the ones that own a strategic plan. And that may be the case that they own it. But I'm a stickler and I'm challenged on this sometimes, but I say, what exactly are you governing if you don't know what the strategy is, right? So to me, in a board, the the changing, and I write about this uh, at, at length in my book, 
the understanding that strategy actually sits above governance, that understanding has to be there for what I view as a successful board director. Otherwise, you're trying to govern something that you don't understand. Remember, the strategy is the how. It's how you're going to get something done. Mm -hmm. And governance doesn't work without understanding the how because that's, as a board member, is what you're overseeing. Once your goals are set for the organization and you're agreed with your CEO or your executive director, in this case for a nonprofit, the board is there to govern the how, which is the strategy. And without an in-depth knowledge of the fundamentals of strategy and an in-depth knowledge and understanding of what that particular organization's strategy is as it pertains to the goals, boards actually become useless. Yeah. Do you suggest that boards are involved in the strategy kind of creation and articulation or are they just there to witness it so they know what they're implementing? I personally believe the board, if it is the correct board, it is instrumental to have them involved with the strategy creation. Yeah. Now, I'll get pushed back on that in some cases because they say, well, isn't that what management or isn't that what the uh, what the leadership of the organization is for at the yeah. management level? And I'll say to that that, you know, many times if I always like to have additional eyes on something and the board, if it's truly built correctly, has the expertise that you want to have look at that strategy. So however you encase this or, or put the umbrella over it, are they involved in creation? Are they reviewing it and giving their input on it? However you want to say that, right, to, to make it sound sound uh, more in line with for what your organization actually, how, how your organization operates, not having the board involved at some level in the strategy is, is a major mistake. Yeah. I've seen it go both ways. <laughs> I've worked with companies where we've had the board involved and worked with companies where we haven't had the board involved. Yeah. And I think there is, there's a, a real kind of power and kind of synergy that happens when the board is involved in developing the strategy, at least at the high level, because they're, you know, they're part of it and they feel a certain commitment and responsibility and they can help guide it. And I think it just makes it much easier in terms of oversight if they're part of the process than, you know, if it become something they weren't involved in because there's sure. too many questions and it's there it's the management's thing it's not the board's thing so there's i just find there's more conflict in that sense but um sure. Sure. so let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the world today so we're in the middle of this covid19 pandemic and i'm curious what you're seeing in terms of i mean this for me this is just like a huge stress test on every single company out there right in terms of strategy and in governance and then making decisions and having to pivot and you know time frames and you know course correction here what have you seen in terms of companies that have you know had to respond to the to the situation and how their boards have responded, how management has responded, any kind of patterns or anything that you've kind of seen in terms of how boards have been operating and, and what good boards have been doing and why they've been doing a good job during this time period? Sure, sure. Well, in my world of board consulting, it has been extremely busy, as you can likely imagine. Yeah. It's both, this time frame is both pointed out major gaps that many have discussed uh, and written about in the board space for years now. A major component of that we just talked about, which is the lack of strategy knowledge and the lack of knowledge of that particular organization strategy. So typically the board members will understand the goals, but they won't have an in-depth knowledge of the how again, which is the strategy of how that was to be implemented. Yeah. So what happened was that these boards went from this operational cozy realm of operations and they were in their governance mode but when it came to now with a leadership team being extremely overwhelmed with everything happening at once and the board had boards in many cases had to step up to truly get involved with the strategy areas they just simply were not able to do it they didn't understand what the strategy previously was so they weren't able to be involved in any type of pivot right and i say that i say that to the level of the depth of knowledge needed to be effective and yeah. pivot an existing strategy the knowledge is, has to be there of, of that organization to that level so it's, it's really caused some of these boards to almost become irrelevant and almost be in the way of what has to happen mm -hmm. with these organizations to course correct in, in these current times. So you'll see a lot of CEOs right now that are extremely overwhelmed and are truly taking the helm right now of not just the organization, but also in the board meetings to mention what's happening as well as explaining why they're doing those things. And it's a little bit of a role reversal because typically the board was saying uh, what they were looking for and comparing those back to the goals that were set. But in many cases right now, the CEOs have set these goals. They've gone for approval with the boards and then they're explaining how they're going to get these, these areas done. But it's um, it's really, I think for my mantra of always pushing this strategy first, governance uh, second, I never would have thought there would have been a time that globally proved that out. But I think we're seeing that right now. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I could see how boards almost become baggage for CEOs if they 
if they really don't know the strategy, if they don't understand what the strategy was, uh, you know, what's going on, how the strategy needs to pivot, they end up spending more time just kind of catching the board up or explaining things to the board than, than right. the board being useful, which That's ideally right. is really what it should be, right? <laughs> the board should be there as a tool and a resource. Absolutely. And, and the other the other piece of this, Bruce, is the availability. So I haven't seen, I, I may actually write an article about this, but uh, I have, a, again, a unique viewpoint because I'm working in many cases as a board consultant. So mm-hmm. I'm in, in the space, but also as an outside viewpoint. So I can compare one board environment to hundreds of other boards. Sure. And what's been interesting in this, and I haven't, again, seen much written about this, is that the ability of board directors to dedicate the time that's needed for each of the organizations that their board directors of are serving, many of them are overboarded right now, which means they're on so many boards, there's not enough time in the day for them to be truly involved and, and effective in this time period of, of COVID-19. So some of these extremely important board meetings where decisions are being made on, on the immediate next steps, it doesn't have the full complement of board members because they're overloaded with all of the companies that they're supposedly serving right now. Yeah. What's a reasonable number of boards that a person can serve on if that's their primary job? The easiest way, I, I get asked that question a lot, Bruce, and the easiest way to look at that is to say that the minimum amount of time that I believe, and this is, I, I believe for a nonprofit, a private, or a public company, I believe it's the same time commitment if you want to be effective and efficient and what you do. I believe you have to look at a baseline of 200 hours a year for each board that, you, uh, that you're that you going to serve. And remember that amount of time ticks up as you take on additional responsibilities with that board. So mm-hmm. a quick example is that if you are a board director and you're also the chairperson, mm-hmm. you attack another 50 hours a year, a minimum on top of that 200 hour base. If you, in addition to being on the board and the chairperson, you're also chairing another committee, yeah. you attack on another 40 hours on top of that. Yeah. So that's a very individualized question but it would say to me if somebody is a full-time CEO and a crisis hits uh, such as right now, do you think that organization is going to be uh, settled with that CEO stepping away to dedicate time as a board director during a time of crisis, which would increase those time frames? Yeah. So some organizations, you know, in order to be a CEO of the organization, they will actually state in the, in their bylaws that that CEO is not allowed to sit on any other boards or a maximum of one. Just because you don't want to have a, I mean, the, the problem is, is that in a time of crisis, <laughs> you know, the CEO and board members are critical. And if you're trying to do it, for two different organizations or multiple organizations, it's not going to work. Well, there are some board directors that's uh, right now, I know they're sitting on seven or eight boards. I just don't wow. know how that's possible because if you multiply that out by the minimum 200 hours a year, and they're also serving as you know the roles of uh, a chair of, of certain committees, um, there's actually not enough hours in a year to fulfill those roles. Yeah. Yeah. I could see the, I could see the complexity. And then you layer on top of that, the fact that we're having to do everything virtually now and you know, it's more complexity to the situation. Yeah. It's interesting. I, you know, like I said, I think this is a big stress test for for a lot of companies, both from a, a leadership and a strategy and a board point of view. So we'll kind of see how this plays out. Mark, if people want to find out more about you and the work that you do, what's the best way to get that information? Sure. I think the easiest way is to hit my website, fistrastrategy.com. It is the uh, PF spelling. So P-F-I- S-T-E-R strategy.com. And it gives a background in all these areas. My book is there as well. If you're interested in uh, everything from in-depth management concepts to specifically applying them to a board structure, that's there uh, in the book across the board. But that's the best way to find me. Great. I'll make sure that the links are in the show notes here so people can click through and get that. Uh, You've got an extensive resume and background. So we'll make sure that all that is in there. People can really kind of get into the details of the work that you've done, which is impressive. So I appreciate your time today. This has been great. I think this is a subject that not many... (laughs) companies really deal with. Certainly not enough, but you know, I think it was really helpful to spend some time talking about it today and I appreciate your time. Bruce, thank you so much. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter. 